In this video, we're going to be reviewing the SysML diagrams. We have nine different types of SysML diagrams that you see here, as well as some of the other different types of diagrams that are available out of the box with Cameo. So Cameo is going to be our software or tool, while SysML, Systems Modeling Language, is the language. This, mo this video is meant for users who are new to the language and just trying to review different diagrams. So we'll first start with the structural diagrams. We have four different structural diagrams, the block definition diagram, the internal block diagram, the package diagram, and the parametric diagram. The parametric diagram is a special type of internal block diagram. What we're actually looking at right now is a BDD or a block definition diagram. So this is the diagram frame. This top thing is the diagram header. BDD is the the shorthand for block definition diagram. Each of the different diagram types are gonna have a shorthand, so internal block diagram is going to be IBD, etc. So what we'll look at is the block definition diagram. You can read a little bit about it right here. The block is the most modular unit of structure. The block definition diagram is how you can either decompose the model or you can create a taxonomy using the generalization relationship. So first we'll look at decomposition. We got our hot air balloon. You can read a little bit about decomposition here. And we got the parts of our hot air balloon, the burger system, the basket, and the parachute. So this right here is our directed composition relationship. So it has a closed ended black diamond on the parent side and then an arrow on the child side. Hot air balloon is the parent, burner system is going to be the child. Now we'll talk about the generalization relationship. It's, uh, it's inheritance. So uh, basically a dog is a type of pet. Uh, visible light is a type of light and distance and feet is a type of real number. So we've got different elements here, block, signal, and value type that we can all see on our block definition diagram. But uh, this is going to show us how different uh, elements or will classify. So visible light and ultraviolet light are going to be a class underneath light. So I can go into my specification and look and see that its space classifier is going to be light. And if I go into light, I can see that the specific classifiers are going to be ultraviolet and visible light. All right. So now we'll jump into the internal block diagram. This is a type of structural diagram. And it's going to, you can read about the internal block diagram here. The purpose of the internal block diagram is to show the relationships between the parts. So it's gonna look similar to an electrical schematic in a way. Uh, you'll have these lines, the, the connectors, and you've got your ports. They can be proxy or full ports. And you've got the item flows that are going across the connectors and these are the part properties that you're seeing here. So our context is this toaster. We have power coming into the toaster and then we've got heat going out of the toaster to toast the toast or toast the bread. So moving on to the next one which is our package diagram. So the package diagram is going to show you how the model is decomposed or how it is laid out while the block definition diagram is talking about how the system of interest is broken down or uh, decomposed. So if we look at the package diagram, you'll be able to see the package diagram is going to correlate with the containment tree that you see here on the left. So, and you'll be able to say that this package act is able to access specific elements or specific uh, packages with the via the access linkage. You can also do uh, imports, etc. So the package diagram is not used all that frequently because the containment tree is so helpful. Um, it's not necessary, but we do use the package diagram sometimes as a navigation page. So you can jump from uh, basically your home navigation page to some of the frequently, you know, access diagrams that you might want to look at. And you can have it in this applet view. You can also have it in this, uh, this view right here, which is going to be like a list view. These are also clickable. So I can 
click here and it, it take me to the glossary table. So now we'll talk about the parametric diagram, which is a special type of internal block diagram. Remember our internal block diagram is talking about the interconnections between parts. The parametric is going to be adding math into that equation. So we have the, the constraint block or the usage of the constraint block in the parametric diagram. So we'll look at that right now. You can see it kind of looks the same. You can show part properties in the parametric diagram. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, this purple rectangle is the usage of the constraint block. And we have a value property, which is in pink, and another value property, which is in pink. So you would have your input. You say your number of magazines. And it would go in and be able to compute the wait time. So I'll just run that super quickly. So if I have number of magazines as six, you're going to be waiting 14.2 minutes. Um, and that's, that's really about it. The, the block which you're running in simulation is going to be the doctor's waiting room block. And uh, yes, it's going to be able to evaluate your constraints. Now jumping back, we're going to go to the behavioral diagrams. We have four different types of behavioral diagrams. We have the activity diagram, the sequence diagram, the state machine diagram, and the use case diagram. So our activity diagram is going to be our most versatile diagram type for the behavioral diagrams. So if you don't know uh, which one to use, then you'll probably want to fall back on using the activity diagram. And so this is your activity diagram. You we have the uh, decision node right there. We have our merge node right there. Um, we have nested activities within activities. So this little fork right here is going to allow me to jump over to, to this um, if I like double click. So I'll zoom back out. If I run this, you'll see how it works in simulation. So it'll ask me a question. My low on fuel? No. Is the race complete? No. And then it'll go in here and run that. And then it'll come by again. If I'm low on fuel, it'll go get fuel. No, we'll say the race is complete and then it's over. So that's some of our basic logic. We also have this fork and join nodes. These are going to allow you to do uh, parallel flows. So there was only one token that you saw there when we ran this. The token is that uh, um, red dot that you see jumping around. Um, and so what happens is if you were to go to the join, you're going to actually multiply the amount of tokens that you have from having one token to having multiple tokens. So um, we'll, we'll show that right now. So your token goes from one token to two tokens, and then the join is going to bring you back from uh, two tokens back to one token. So I could even add in another action here and maybe that would make it a little bit more clear. So there you go. All right, we'll now look at our sequence diagram. The sequence diagram is going to be one trace or one scenario. It's not going to allow you to do all of the different scenarios at once, like the activity diagram. What I mean by that is um, the activity diagram is giving you options. It's saying, you know, do you, is the race complete or are you or are you low on fuel yes no and it will uh, follow that logic and get to the end uh, the sequence diagram has only one scenario at a time and so it's going to have these are lifelines that you see on the top time is going on as you go from top to the bottom so the items which occur on the top are going to happen first. So one, two, three, four, five, etc. cetera. Uh, we've got just like a time constraint here and uh, messages to self. There's different types of messages. There's uh, asynchronous and synchronous messages. The asynchronous message is going to be the open ended arrow that you see here. And the synchronous messages are going to be the closed ended arrow which uh, I guess you would see here, but uh, let me just go into the specification and you'll be able to see it. So when it's uh, open, it's asynchronous. If I change this to synchronous, you'll see that the message changes to a solid arrowhead. Uh, 
and that means that there's going to be a reply. Um, a reply message is going to look like this, a dotted line. And so for every single synchronous message, you're going to have a dotted line reply message to show that um, that synchronous message is complete. I'm not really showing that here. You don't have to actually show the reply message in the sequence diagram. I do think it's good practice to do that, but you don't have to. Um, so that's the sequence diagram. The state machine diagram is, you can read a little bit about the state machine here, make it a little bit bigger. And we can run this in simulation. And it's going to ask us questions. Actually, what I'm going to do is run it with context. So it's going to run it with the uh, associated state machine diagram block, which has this value property of x. Um, you don't have to know all that, but it's going to make the simulation work so that the x value iterates accordingly. Once it iterates accordingly, um, we can send signals. So signal one, and it will go over and we can have entry, do, and exit criteria for each of the different states. And we can send different signals to um, change our X value or change states, etc. So you've got, uh, for more details about the sequence diagram, watch our sequence diagram video. We're not going to go into the details of the sequence diagram at this time. The last one is the use case diagram. This is an example of a use case diagram. The surveillance system ha is the system of interest in this case. And we have, these are our use cases, these uh, ovals. And they're always going to be a verb noun phrase. Um, you try to keep the amount of use cases from between about two to about 10 use cases. Any more than that, it gets unwieldy. Any less than that, you need to think a little bit more about the, the use of your um, system of interest. So, and you can jump it from, you know, initialized system into either sequence diagram or an activity diagram. Uh, that is totally appropriate. This diagram type is going to uh, only be useful at the very beginning of your program when you and your stakeholders are sitting there trying to determine what your system of interest is supposed to do versus what are the external actors and how is your system of interest going to uh, communicate with those external actors. So it's quite um, often that you would create an IBD after creating this uh, initial use case diagram. The internal block diagram would be the surveillance system and then you would have um, your actors designated with blocks and then you'd be able to describe the exact item flows that are going out of your system of interest to and from the external actors. It will be kind of similar to an OV1. So that is all of our behavioral diagrams. Now we'll look at the requirement diagram. Just like the use case diagram, this requirement diagram is only useful at the very beginning of your project when you only have a couple of requirements. So you'll have user needs um, and it's at the very beginning of your like IRAD, for example, and you're going to be talking with the stakeholder and trying to write down uh, all of the things that the stakeholder wants. And then that will qu quickly tree out into a whole multitude of requirements that are going to be derived from let's just say these, this set of four requirements. Um, and then once you get to a amount of requirements that like over 15 or 20, it doesn't make sense to have them in a requirements diagram. It's often that you would put them in a table. So we can talk about tables now. That's a perfect segue. So there's many different types of tables. And uh, the one that we were just talking about is the requirement table. So the requirement table is a special type of generic table, which is a type of table. So the requirement table 
if this is how to tabulate the um, requirement diagram that we saw before. And this is a much better way to use it uh, or look at requirements uh, rather than the diagram once you have a bunch of them. Our example only has four. So um, our, our generic table, this is uh, if you're just trying to make anything that you'd like, um, you can put any amount of columns that you can think of. You can create custom columns and um, you can do a lot of stuff with this generic table. Pretty much anything, any relationship that is in the model, you can show it on these tables and you can scope the uh, where you're looking for elements, what type of element you're looking for. Like right now, we're just looking for the activity diagram to start with and then we're looking at all of the nodes that are associated with that activity. Um, again, you could do anything, super flexible. The black box ICD table and white box ICD table, we're going to go back to our toaster example. So our black box is going to show us, you know, what are the items that flow into and out of the toaster from a black box perspective. And if I go back to our white box, this this is going to be all of the items which are going to flow inside of the toaster. The context is the toaster. And uh, yeah, that's what we have. And these two are available out of the box with Cameo. And so all you have to do, super easy, there's no setup. You just drag your toaster from your containment tree onto this location right here and you're done. So Cameo is making it very easy for you. The next type of table is the glossary table. This is a very helpful table because it has this underlying feature, which is available to you anywhere in the model. So if I add a new term such as like frog, and then I'll just say animal that jumps. And then I can go into any diagram anywhere and type in frog and I will be able to, uh, like highlight over it and it will give me the description of that table or, or of that uh, term. And I can click right there and it will take me to it. So again, very, very helpful. And it doesn't have to be in text. It can be like a block itself. It's called frog. And uh, you'll see it works. Very, very cool. So you can do that. I suggest making an acronym table and uh, using that. So the metrics table, this table is it's kind of like the package diagram where the package diagram is talking about how the model is formed, not the system of interest. This metric table is talking about how complete the model is, not how not anything about the actual system of interest. So what it's going to be doing is um, taking, I've got several different snapshots at different dates and times, and it, it's going to just do a count of how many elements there were. And um, if I had filled this out, you, you can uh, just evaluate metrics. It will tell you, you know, what percentage of requirements have been satisfied, uh, how many requirements are there. So it can show you over time, you know, I've got 20, requirements and 15 of them have been satisfied so it would show me 75 percent over here and then i would have the verification as well how many uh requirements have been verified it would give me a percentage there and then if you take enough of these snapshots over time you'll be able to make a graph and and show you know how close you are to completing the model and how fast you are modeling and all of those programmatic things that you know, your your lead is going to care about. I will caveat this with it's super easy to cheat it. So um, if if the modeler knows he's being tracked, he can easily massage these numbers to make them look good. So just know that uh, the instance table is the last type of table that we have to talk about. And so instances, we haven't talked about them. They are essentially snapshots in time. Um, I've kind of used it in this example. Uh, we've got our Domino's, different types of pizzas, and it's going to allow you to 
to make um, different types of pizzas um, because I've, I've got the taxonomy in the background and you can, I, I basically have copied the Domino's pizza tracker. So you can, you know, create your own configuration here. Um, and so this instance is, like I said, a snapshot in time. Um, you'll have to look at other videos for more definitions on instances, but um, we're just going to leave it here. The instance table is just a way to show your instances. All right, then we have the dependency matrix. The dependency matrix, there are this abstract one, which is, um, and this is kind of similar to the generic table for, ta for tables. Um, and then we have all these specific ones that are available out of the box for you uh, to use. So it's, they're easier to use, less uh, configurable. But this matrix, um, We've got all the UML types of diagrams on the left and all of the SysML diagrams on the top. And we've kind of, we've created an association between the two. Um, and this is just kind of to help somebody new um, to, to SysML, maybe like you understand how the UML diagrams map to the SysML diagrams. So in, in most cases, like you would have um, your system of interest here and the different parts on one side and maybe the activities on the other and you would allocate them so you would connect the behaviors to the structure via the allocation relationship so you can change the relationship type from association to any of this any of these from this list um, there's a ton of different types of relationships that are available to you. You can also create like uh, directed composition relationships or generalization relationships just by um, changing the dependency to generalization. And then just by to create a relationship, you just double click here and then you say create and that will create the relationship. So it's very uh, good for gap analysis. Um, you can you can show only the uh, columns or just the ones with relations um, and where you can show them all. So this is very good for like gap analysis. Uh, we have the derive relate or requirement matrix. So again, this is just a special type of, uh, you know, generic matrix, but um, most of these have been filled out for you already. Um, it's going to be derived, it has a special like icon that goes with it. And then, um, you know, you have your user needs and then your, your more detailed, um, requirements and you have your derived relationship here. So we're not going to go through all the other different types of specific matrices that exist, but you can just go here and type in matrix and you'll see that they each have their own special little icon um, and that that's pretty much it so next we have the maps so we have the generic relationship map and so this all i did here was i sh i'm showing just relationship the generalization relationship and so the system l diagram it's going down and there's three different types of specific classifiers to the system L diagram. So if I go to my specification, see specific classifiers, I got three of them and one, two, three right there. And so that's what I'm doing um, with my relation criteria. I can change the amount of depth that goes into and um, I can show I can show it in all sorts of different ways. You can like make it radial instead of the tree. I prefer the tree in most cases, but um, there's a lot of different uh, things you can do with that. We also have an instance map, which again, is just a specific type of map that makes it super easy. 
So all I did was I dragged my instance tables package onto this uh, um, map and it automatically is showing me all of the different instances that have been created within my containment tree. And just like the matrices, there's a lot of different other types of maps that are available out of the box, but uh, I think you understand. Lastly, we have the simulation configuration diagram. And this is an example of what one of those looks like. When you create one of these, the whole purpose is to run it in simulation. So um, we ran the state machine diagram earlier. And let's say that we wanted to run it and be able to plot the X variable as it changed over time. We also wanted to automatically create a sequence diagram from the um, state machine diagram. So we've got this auto sequence diagram uh, action. And so when we create this simulation configuration, it actually puts it up here in the toolbar. So if I change this guy's name, you'll see that it changes up here. And I can just push play. I've, I've basically just dragged state machine diagram from the containment tree onto here. And I've created my timeline chart. Um, and when I run it, you'll see that uh, it's doing my X value over time. If I put this over to the side, it's doing my auto sequence diagram generation. Uh, we'll try to switch back to the state machine diagram that's being run. So now I can, if I use signal three, so I'll go over here to Delta and you see that the user um, sends the signal one, it goes to the Delta echo state and the value of X remains constant at this point. So if I go back using signal three, you see that X equals X minus one. So I'm gonna do that. And you see that X went down and uh, yeah, you can graph things, you can show the state in a state chart if you'd like. There's a lot of options here with your simulation configuration. So with that, that is all the different diagrams that are available to you out of the box with Cameo. And when I say Cameo, I mean Cameo Enterprise Architecture or Cameo Systems Modeler. That is the software or tool and then our nine different types of SysML diagrams are block definition diagram, internal block diagram, package diagram, parametric diagram, requirement diagram, activity diagram, sequence diagram, state machine diagram, and use case diagram. Hope this overview helped.